Native Americans have been living in Kentucky for at least 12,000 years. Drawn to the abundant wildlife of our state, Native cultures flourished here for millennia, creating weapons for hunting, shelters for protection, nets for fishing, pottery for cooking and eating, and baskets for storage. And as cultures changed, so too did the landscape. Today, in many of these same areas, you will now find Lake Cumberland, a man-made lake, the result of damming the Cumberland River. Thousands of visitors swim, fish, boat, and live on the lake throughout the year. But what about the people who inhabited this area so long ago? Who were they? How did they live? Where are their descendants today? Where did they go? How do we know they were here at all? What did they leave behind to help tell their story? These questions have been answered by archaeologists and historians who have worked to locate and identify many historical areas around and even in the lake. But they can't do it alone. So what can you do to protect the past so that we can continue to share this history in the future? Each year for the past 30 years, elementary students in Kentucky have been able to attend Living Archaeology Weekend. The two-day event brings the past to life with demonstrations of Native American technologies including food, farming, homes, weapons, and tools, providing the students with a hands-on educational experience. Students at Lexington's Glendover Elementary are currently studying Native American history in Kentucky. These students were lucky enough to attend Living Archaeology Weekend they were able to learn from artifacts found by archaeologists. An archaeologist is someone who studies artifacts from the past. They find, they find things that you could have dropped. Some, when people leave stuff behind, they'll find it and they'll study it. They are the people who study the artifacts and try to tell how old they are, tell what they are, what they were used for. What is an artifact? A handmade object, a tool, or piece of one as a shirt of pottery from a past culture and often studied by archaeologists. The evidence that archaeologists use to piece together this story of the ancient American Indian past consists principally of durable, hard things, stone tools, spear points, scrapers, knives. Also, when people develop pottery, pottery survives quite well, um, usually broken, um, often just a shirt here and there, but sometimes in garbage pits we can find pieces that we can put almost a whole pot together again. In those pits we can also find burned seeds that tell us what the people were eating. In some cases what they were growing in their gardens. That's how we know people were farmers. What is an archaeological site? An archaeological site is a place where evidence of past human activity is preserved. Um, these sites teach us about maybe how they utilized it local resource. How did, how did we survive day to day without electricity, without running water, without penicillin? We can learn about their past, what they use for medicine, what they use for clothing, what they use for hunting. And maybe when we learn about their history, we can learn something from that. It is important for us to preserve and protect our artifacts so that we get, for the future generations can know what, what it was like a long time ago. Cherokee people are really curious. They want to know, uh, you know, what, what did they eat a long time ago? Are there, there things that we've forgotten that you might be able to tell us? And I can piece together a lot of stuff. Um, and I find, you know, really cool information. Uh, you know, there were, cooking bear meat this way and this is how they're making their pots. So you know the potters ask me you know how are they making their pots? How, how can I make mine the old way, the way their ancestors made them? So I like we trade information like that. They, they help me identify what I'm looking at when I don't know and I help them when they have questions about the archaeology part of it. Other than what we have been able to find in these special historic sites, much of the history we learn from Native Americans comes from spoken word stories passed on over generations, including creation stories about where people come from. In one of our creation stories, this, this was all water, and the water spider built 
this land up and it become it was mud. And the animals are like we live here on this little island surrounded by mud. How how do we live on mud? So the buzzard says, I think I can help. So he takes off with his great big wingspan, starts flying around in circles, and he's looking, trying to figure out how to help. So he starts flying closer to the ground. And he's just working away, drying the earth, drying this mud. Well, every now and then he makes a mistake and wing dips low, he cut a little groove in the mud. Well, that's how these rivers got created. And maybe he made a little ripple. So you get these little rolling hills out here. But that's how he made this. That's how these mountains and rivers was created from the buzzard and the lakes. Shawnee people say that we are all descended from one woman that we call our grandmother. This original woman was at the shore of you know a huge lake. In English, we call it the underwater panther or the horned panther. That panther at one time basically came up out of the water and grabbed that woman, our grandmother, and took her under the water. And she was gone for a while, and then basically the water receded, and there was that woman standing there holding on to the tail of that underwater panther. And they, you know, the elders say that that is our grandmother and all of the Shawnee people are descended from that woman, that one woman. And so that's why she is so important to us, you know, and we give thanks and honor her and acknowledge her in our prayers, in our ceremonies. The first known people to appear in Kentucky within the archaeological record are the Paleo-Indian peoples. Many archaeologists think that Paleo-Indian people came to North America from Northeast Asia by crossing the Bering Land Bridge and following the coastline. However, they lived in a way that did not leave much in the form of archaeological evidence. And it's the time period that marks the real discovery of America by the ancestors of the American Indians. And Paleo-Indians certainly hunted at some point in their lives mammoths, mastodons, giant ground sloths. Hunting in the uh, early times was hard because there, there was big animals like mammoths and bisons, but Native Americans used stuff like arrowhead spears and atlas to make it easier to hunt them, and they would use every part of them, so they used the skin, the intestines, and the brain, they used all of it. But that was probably only a portion of their diet. We're limited in what we can say about the Paleo-Indian way of life because all they left us is stone tools, like the famous Clovis point, a stone spear point that's got a flute or a groove in, on both sides on the base. But similar points have been found all over North America. During the Archaic period, we begin to see technologies develop, including the creation of tools and weapons, as well as farming. The Archaic culture begins at the end of the Ice Age, at about 8,000 BC, and extends for thousands of years up to about 1,000 BC or even 800 BC. And it's this period when the Kentucky forests are basically what they were in the historic time period, and these people are hunters and gatherers, like the Paleo-Indian peoples before, and they develop new technologies, technologies that the Paleo-Indians didn't develop, that really mark the Archaic period. They used pump drills, which are pretty much spears with sticks and ropes on them that you would push up and down and it would drill holes and you could drill and make um, things. In addition to the stone tool points, they make ground stone tools out of granite and other hard stone and turn those into axes and adzes. And through this long period of the Archaic period, it's not just sort of a hunting and gathering way of life. It changes, sometimes subtly, but sometimes significantly through that time period. By the end of the Archaic period, though, they have begun experimenting with a variety of plants that later become domesticated plants. So a lot of change in the this, in this Archaic period, including social change, because also during the Archaic, by the end of it, we see 
significant changes in sort of styles of some of the stone tools and things that indicate that we're developing regional cultures. It's not as homogenous as, for example, the Paleo-Indian cultures look. The appearance of pottery can be traced back to the woodland period. The use of pottery for cooking and its greater storage capacity has taught us that people began to remain in the same locations over longer periods of time. We also see a greater preservation of fibers that are woven into clothing, baskets, shoes, and other objects. Um, they found clay from the ground and they created pots that they could put food or clothing or anything in. And they would paint different designs and like pictures on it. And so then it would not only um, be good for like using, but it would also look good at the same time. Most of the time it would tell a story um, and it would tell the um, archaeologists today like about what was happening then. So this agriculture, which sort of allows people to be more sedentary, because they're more sedentary, they make pottery, heavy clay pots with thick walls in this, the earliest woodland period. That pottery appears because people are sedentary, but it, people only made pottery when they're settling down because mobile people don't want to carry around these heavy breakable pots. So pottery is a big innovation that marks the beginning of the woodland period. Also, pottery is wonderful because it's a, a, a canvas on which people can artistically represent different styles. So those different regional cultures we saw subtly expressed in stone tools in, in the archaic, now we see them sort of more extravagantly expressed, or as, as it goes on at least, as they can put designs on pottery that are very different from one region to another. The woodland period ends at around 1000 AD this is a period when there's another dramatic social change, and in this case, people have become full-blown farmers, growing maize, beans, and squash, the Three Sisters. The Three Sisters were corn, beans, and squash. They were three plants that were grown often and year-round, and they were easy to grow, and you could grow them all next to each other. In Kentucky, the Mississippian peoples appear around 1000 AD. They lived in large villages in western Kentucky and the Cumberland River area. Temples and chief houses were built on mounds. They farmed but continued to hunt. Wycliffe Mounds is an archaeological site of a Native American village of the Mississippian mound culture. Now this site, this village site, dates back to the 1100s to the 1300s. It's situated on a bluff overlooking the Mississippi River. Uh, we're a tribe uh, homelands, Alabama, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Mississippi. This was, was, was established, hadn't been there for, we say from the beginning, I guess, that's where we came from. We were village people. We weren't like northern tribes. We stayed. We stayed where we was at. But back back then, uh, we were all one people. Like talking earlier, but we was all one people. So all our songs are the same. The only thing that would be different is our language. We can go dance with them people, the southeastern tribes I'm talking about down this part. But we can go dance with uh, them, or they can go dance with us. When we dance, it's a meaning from us inside. To, to ask for things and things like that. But today we share them. Used the woods out here to, for our homes. We had what we call a summer home. They had the drafts of the open in the tops of the summer. And then the winters would be all closed and uh, just a fire in the middle. Keep it going with different housing, different seasons. So. They're all connected by these riverways, these waterways. And we have like, like the Cumberland River, the Tennessee River, the uh, Mississippi River, the Ohio River. And these riverways were ways for these native people to travel for trade goods, hunting, connecting village to village over time. The Fort Ancient people also lived around 1000 AD along the Ohio River and in central and eastern Kentucky. They farmed and lived in villages and also continued to hunt. By the Fort Ancient culture, population has risen, villages have gotten much larger, there's some evidence of, of competition between villages, conflict.
The Fort Ancient culture uses the bow and arrow, hunting bear and beaver and wild turkey, but also it's used in conflict because sometimes we'll find those arrowheads in a deer skeleton, but we'll also find them sometimes in, in people. The Fort Ancient period ends at about 1550, 1600, really the dawn of the historic era. And it's almost like a, a black hole in terms of our knowledge because of the devastating impact of European Americans arriving on the continent and bringing with them not just muskets that allowed them to, to fight with warfare, but also diseases that American Indians had never been exposed to before. We have eight states that are ancestral homelands. Oh, so it's a, it's a really big area to know a lot about. Um, I mean, people are coming and going from this area all the time, but I do believe there were Cherokee people here. I've seen, you know, uh, archaeology sites that I believe are Cherokee. For the Shawnee people, we did have villages in uh, Kentucky uh, while we were hunting for animal like, you know, deer, bear, turkey, buffalo down in the area. Our feelings is that the Creator put this land here for us to all provide sustenance for. He put the deer, the bear, the turkey, all of the trees, the plants, the medicinal plants, the food plants, he put those here on our Mother Earth for all Indian people to provide from sustenance. No one tribe can own that, right? And so representing on this belt is exactly what uh, that idea is that's worked in this wampum. Wampum is uh, shell beads. The Indian people here believe that this environment, you know, this earth here, the, our, our mother, is one, one dish, one, one bowl that we are all to eat out of. While populations were not as great as the Mississippian and Fort Ancient cultures, archaeological records connect the pre-contact cultures of Kentucky to today's tribes. Indians and Europeans did interact on a friend, you know, friendly basis. We find European trade beads in Fort Ancient sites, but along with those objects, people were exchanging germs one to another. So those diseases came into the Ohio Valley before the first Europeans came here, decimating, more than decimating, the populations that were here. Although Native American populations declined during this time frame, we still have their oral histories that have been passed down through the generations, as well as archaeological sites to add information about the past. So yeah, we're looking right at uh, Wolf Creek Dam. The main purpose of our lake is, you know, flood storage, flood water storage on the Cumberland River, and also uh, hydroelectric power, which is created just on the downstream side of the dam. Full uh, flood pool elevation, which is elevation 760 feet above mean sea level, that's uh, 1,255 miles of shoreline. And to kind of put that, I guess to scale that to something you can wrap your brain around, that's more coastline than the state of Florida has. As the dam has aged and the water pressure behind it has been, been constant, we've had uh, water seeping below the dam, the foundation. And so to correct that, we essentially built a new dam internally in it. It's called a barrier wall. So to relieve pressure on the dam for safety, um, the the lake was drawn down to about 10 feet below what it normally is in the wintertime. And through that exposure, it exposed an, over 1,300 miles of shoreline that we normally don't see. And in that 1,300 miles of shoreline, there were sites that we haven't had a look at since uh, 1946. So that gave us an opportunity to do some, some um, inventories of archaeological sites in certain areas of the lake. So when we do these inventories, it helps us to learn settlement patterns and how people were using the land uh, through different periods at different times and what parts of the land that they were using. Prior to European contact, archaeology is a major source of data. We have oral histories from Native Americans, but we also, but the archaeology uh, provides us data that we can, we can 
pose questions, ask questions of it, study it, and use it to answer those questions. Because there are no written records from these ancient North American cultures, the artifacts they left behind are the only record of their lives. So it's vitally important to preserve them, to be able to know exactly where that spear point came from, what soil level, because each of those artifacts, whether it's a pottery shirt, a stone tool, or a piece of burned corn, the story you can tell is limited by the, the context information that we have. We can learn very valuable information about our history from artifacts, and if we destroy that, we're just taking away a chunk of knowledge that we can learn and a chunk of knowledge that for future generations to learn. Artifacts can break easily and if you're walking on artifacts they will crack and it's hard to study them when they're cracked and bits and pieces. Um, then like an archaeologist couldn't go and see how old it is, see what it is. It could be something entirely new that they knew nothing about, but now they know it could. If we don't protect these artifacts, there will no longer be artifacts for us to learn about, therefore making it harder for us to find out about our past, and they are educational. So if we distorted these artifacts now, then the people of the, pre and then the, people of the future won't be able to know them. So if you pick a spear point up out of a cornfield, put it in your pocket and take it home, you've sort of taken that page of history and torn it out of a book. But by leaving it in place and having an archeologist record exactly where it was found and take it back to the lab and study it, put a number on it and associate that number with that site and that particular square meter or even that exact spot that's been mapped in precisely, it creates a kind of written record that then archeologists of the future can go back and read and interpret to find out what happened at that site, which cultures were there, which followed which. Um, these artifacts that you'll find on a shoreline from a drawdown, it may expose a historically Cherokee site, town. Um, these artifacts was left behind by our ancestors and we as a people don't feel they belong personally to us. They belong to whom they belong to. And it's very disrespectful to pick up artifacts. Even though we're not physically here, we are still spiritually, spiritually connected to these places as a people. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers protects uh, cultural resources as a matter of public stewardship. Uh, these archaeological sites and historic sites are, are public, public resources. They're owned um, and managed for all because once they're destroyed, we, it's destroyed. Archaeological sites do not reproduce. Um, once that, that information is gone, it's gone, and it's gone forever. People might happen upon uh, an archaeological site and they might, they might not even know what they're looking at at first, but that's probably where we're at the largest risk for exploitation come around, maybe you see something exposed on the soil and they don't know what they're looking at, but if we can get around and engage visitors, you know, we can help them understand what we have here, what they're looking at, why it's beneficial to, to leave it. You know, if they want to experience it, look at it, take a picture of it, leave it there. Leave it for the next person, leave it for the next generation. You know, I think educations are, that's the best tool we have. The main thing we can do is we can educate people. Uh, we can let them know why, you know, it is illegal, but more importantly than that, why it's illegal. Why, why we want to have these resources here, why we need to protect them. It's not that we want to or we should. And uh, we try to articulate that in a way to visitors that, uh, you know, they'll leave here with a newfound appreciation for what we have here and, you know, hopefully be invested in protecting it. If they want to take some memories of it, take a picture of it. And then you can also take that information and report it to your park ranger. And that information can go into our database and we have a more complete understanding of what happened here. We really don't believe in ownership. No one person owns this land. The Creator put it here for all of us. Really, in old school, traditional um, Shawnee and other Native American cultures, you think about yourself last. You think about your community and everyone else first, and yourself last. You know, history is one thing in a book, 
But when you have a site that shows archaeological evidence of this stuff in books and you can physically and, and you know see it and walk at it and see the artifacts that came from there and we have protected that, you know, not just artifacts, but graves that may have been there, you know. When we can see that, then we really can understand the history and you know, not just what's written in a book, you know, it's it's tangible, you know. We can we can physically see it, we can touch it, you know, and that's powerful. In in the Cherokee language we have no word for goodbye. Um because it's never goodbye. The closest you can ever find to goodbye is um I wanna say Dana Da, go hun you which means until we meet again. So the next time you and your family take a walk, hike a trail, swim in a lake, or picnic on a beautiful sunny Kentucky day, think back to a family over a thousand years ago doing the exact same thing and remember how important this land was to them just as it is for you today.